It's the Maxwell Institute podcast. It's the latest All right, so a Catholic, a Protestant, and a Jew walk into a university conference room. It sounds like the setup to a great joke. It's not. It's actually the origin story of a great book called The Bible and the Believer, How to Read the Bible Critically and Religiously. It was published in 2012 by Oxford University Press. What happens when a believer approaches their sacred text using academic tools of study? Three distinguished biblical scholars with three different religious backgrounds came together to discuss how their critical study of the Bible has enriched their religious devotion to Scripture. So in this episode, I'm speaking with one of the three authors of this book, Dr. Mark Brettler of Brandeis University. Dr. Brettler is a practicing Jew and a practicing university professor. He discusses the history of biblical interpretation in Jewish communities, and he'll also give a primer on what academic study of the Bible looks like today. This episode is part one of a special two-part series focusing on the book, The Bible and the Believer. I'm your host, Blair Hodges, and questions or comments about this and other episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast can be sent to mipodcast at byu.edu. Please don't forget to take a second and review the podcast in iTunes. I'm joined today by the Dora Golding Professor of Biblical Studies at Brandeis University, Mark Brettler. He joins us from Massachusetts. Welcome to the Maxwell Institute podcast, and thanks for taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to talk to you. The question that we're focused on in this episode is this. Can the Bible be read both critically and religiously? Does scholarship harm religious belief, or can it enhance it, or does it have a a mixed record? This is the focus of an excellent book that was published about two years ago by uh, Oxford University Press. The book is called The Bible and the Believer, and and you, uh, Dr. Brettler, uh, you represented uh, the Jewish faith in that book, and there was also an author who was Protestant and an author who is Catholic, so you sort of brought this together. What was the, the genesis of this book, uh, and the pun is intended. What was the genesis of the book? Well, I wish I could follow up your pun with a better pun, (laughs) but uh, the genesis is like the genesis of many books, an accident. In In 2010, I was invited along with my two collaborators, uh, Peter Enns and unfortunately now the late Daniel Harrington, to a a small symposium at the University of Pennsylvania where we were asked to discuss this particular topic. I give a lot of talks, many of them at universities, and I suspected that we'd be walking into a small room with between a dozen and 20 people. That's how it usually is. That's what it usually is. <laughs> uh, to my great surprise, there were between 200 and 300 people there, many students, many people from the community. And that gave us all an indication that there really was significant interest in this particular topic. And we spoke. We realized that really we're able to speak to each other rather than at each other. We found it inter- the points of convergence interesting and the points of disagreement to be very important. And already that night after dinner, we started to plan the book and uh, the book happened. So that's the genesis of the book. So the symposium ended up being kind of an opportunity then to dialogue with uh, people of other faiths who we all come together on the same uh, well, we think we come together on this same book, right? We, we come together on what Christians refer to as the Old Testament and what Jews often refer to as the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew Scriptures. And so when you're going into this, there was a little bit of anxiety maybe, or was it something that you kind of looked forward to to joining that conversation? I'm going to answer your question in a moment. But first, let me just make it clear to you and to your readers that it actually is not the case that we're all talking about the same book. Right. Because for Jews and Protestants, the Hebrew Bible slash Old Testament does indeed have the same contents, but the same, but the books, the order of the books is different. And if you were to really think about that a little bit, how you order the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament really does make a difference. Is the last section the prophets, 
or is the last section as it is in the case of Judaism, the writings. And of course, it gets even more complicated if you're Catholic, because not only do you have that difference, but the Catholics have as part of the Old Testament, the books which the Protestants will call the Apocrypha. And there are certain biblical books which really take a different form in the Catholic Church versus the Protestant Church and the Jewish synagogue. For example, the book of Esther and the book of Daniel have, from the Jewish and Protestant perspective, extra chapters in them that are not there in the Hebrew Bible. So it's not exactly the same book. Uh, that we were talking about. It was largely the same book that we were talking about. But then to get back to your the question itself, we, I really had no anxiety about it. This is something that I was looking forward to. Uh, I am a believer and I am a critical scholar of the Hebrew Bible. I have been thinking about these issues for a long time. I had put down some of my thoughts concerning these issues several years earlier when I wrote a book called How to Read the Bible, later republished as How to Read the Jewish Bible, where I thought I needed to have an afterword because I knew the book would be distressing to some people. And that afterword was called How to Read the Bible as a Committed Jew. So I really only thought to begin to put my thoughts together in the year 2005. That was a really brief afterward to a longer project. And I saw this particular project, both the talk and then the book, as really an opportunity to develop my ideas more fully and to develop them in relation to the way that other faith groups understand these same issues. Uh, none of us was trying to convince the other people. What we were really just trying to do is to see what solutions we shared in common, what differences we might have, and perhaps to have the hope that, given that these religions have to some extent developed separately, maybe there could be some solutions and possibilities that developed in one religious tradition that might be valid for one of the other religious traditions. Yeah, so what, what seems to be the, the main commonality between these different religious traditions is the idea that scholarship can be brought to bear on what's considered to be a sacred text, and that for some believers, that can be unsettling or that can present complications that seem to challenge um, traditional beliefs, right? So... Let's back up, and I think for a lot of our listeners, uh, they're probably unfamiliar with much of bi biblical criticism, what used to be called higher criticism. So I, I wonder if you can give kind of a basic description or uh, definition of what biblical criticism, broadly speaking, is, and then we'll kind of drill down from there. Okay, sure. And I'm going to do this really by starting with two people who are separated from each other by about two and a half centuries. In some sense, the beginning of biblical criticism is in the Reformation, the year 1517, with Luther hanging up his 95 theses and the way these ultimately were developed several centuries later in the development, I'm sorry, in the Reformation. Uh, key to Luther was the notion of sola scriptura. In other words, the notion that each individual has the right, indeed the obligation, to explain scripture for himself or for herself. This was a very significant break with the authority of the Catholic Church, and I think in some sense really needs to be viewed as the beginning of critical biblical scholarship, though I'm sure Luther had he lived to see how it developed, would not have been terribly happy with those developments. Uh, the next key figure whom I would isolate was born as Baruch Spinoza, was died as Benedict Spinoza. He lived from 1632 to 1677. The name change reflects the fact that he was excommunicated from the Jewish community in Amsterdam. And one of the most important books that he wrote, the most important from my perspective, is called The, uh, the Theological Political Tractate, in which he has a chapter called On the Interpretation of Scripture. 
And in there, he has a single line that I would like to read and then to talk about as a set for a few minutes, because I really think that that line is the most important line for understanding the development of critical biblical scholarship. The line I'm reading in English, not in Latin, goes like this. Now, to put it briefly, I hold that the method of interpreting scripture is no different from the method of interpreting nature and is, in fact, in complete accord with it. What this line does is it normalizes the Hebrew Bible. It says that the Hebrew Bible needs to be interpreted as any other book, as any other feature of nature. It does not need to be interpreted as what I would call a privileged text written by an author with a capital A, but instead should be interpreted the way in which any other ancient text should be interpreted. And of course, it's important to remember that Spinoza is living after the Renaissance, after ancient texts from the Greek world were rediscovered and were interpreted within their historical context. So what this meant was that if an earlier interpretation of the Bible, two texts were seen as contradicting each other, and an earlier traditional interpretation, whether rabbinic interpretation or interpretation within the church, these contradictions had to be seen as apparent contradictions and would be reconciled one way or another. So, so what just just to clear so you're basically saying that when you when you look at the text you'll find bumps in the text or things that apparently contradict, right? And so the assumptions of earlier readers prior to Spinoza would assume that those things were there deliberately or that they signaled something. Is that Exactly, that they signaled something, and the two texts certainly can be reconciled. And Spinoza so was saying, like, well, maybe it's just a mistake. Well, not that it's just a mistake. Or He was really saying maybe this reflects different views from different authors, right. different times that were incorporated into the text. So let me give you an example. I'll start with a rabbinic example, and then we'll go into... Spinoza doesn't deal with a specific context, but I'll talk about what biblical scholarship does in relation to this. And actually, I'll give you two examples, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. uh, your readers might well be familiar with the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. Anyone who reads the Bible at least gets that far. And if you read those chapters, it is quite clear to me that there are two stories which contradict each other in those chapters. And so, for example, in the first chapter, the order of creation is birds, land animals, and then man and woman are created together in Genesis 1.27, while in the second and third chapter, man is created, then God is looking for companionship for man, then the birds and the land animals are created, and then afterwards, woman is created. Now, in rabbinic and early church interpretation, these two stories were meshed together somehow, and the second story was seen as filling in certain details of the first story. So, for example, the second story deals with the Garden of Eden, that's absent in the first story. The second story deals with the expulsion of humans from the Garden of Eden. And the rabbis in the church often assumed that this happened on the sixth day of creation. And they do this because they are blending together the first story, which has six days of creation, where people are created on the sixth with the second story concerning the Garden of Eden. The two stories are intertwined interpretatively. Now, with Spino following Spinoza, he did not make this specific observation about those initial chapters, following, but following this basic principle, people then said to themselves, hold it, these two chapters are really telling very different stories. It is not easy to meld them together into a single consistent narrative. 
their apparent contradictions are not apparent only, but they are real contradictions. Thus, they are not a single story from an author with a capital A, but two different stories from different authors, lowercase a, different time periods, different places, different perspectives, and so forth. So that can only happen post Spinoza. Or since the Torah large is a combination of narrative and law, let me give you a legal example and how it would be dealt with pre-Spinoza and post-Spinoza. And this was assumed, by the way, that these, the Torah itself uh, was supposed to have been written by Moses, right? Like, so right. one it's author... Single author written by Moses, but not by himself, reflecting God. Right, In other words, so... There, or in the end of the book of, uh, toward the middle end of the book of Exodus, Moses is on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights. And the traditional assumption is, or the question is, what was he doing there? Well, he was writing down the text of the Torah, which we still have. So let me just step back. Do I have a second for yeah. a legal example as Absolutely. well? Absolutely. So a legal example concerning slavery. You know, a painful and difficult issue. Uh, slavery is mentioned, or laws concerning slavery, appear three times in the Hebrew Bible. Once in Exodus 21, once in Leviticus 25, and once in Exodus chapter 15. Now, in Exodus and Deuteronomy, a slave who loves his, a Hebrew slave who loves his master can say that he loves his master, his ear is pierced, and he, say, he stays in, his slave's house, in the slave owner's householder as a slave of sorts. Le'olam is the Hebrew word, le'olam, which means forever or in perpetuity. As opposed to that, in Leviticus chapter 25, if a person becomes impoverished and is sold as a slave, he is released in the Jubilee year, which is once every 50 years. These are cycles of 50 years. Now, that meant that you could not be a slave in perpetuity. How did the traditional pre-Spinoza modes of interpretation deal with that? They said, and this is found already in an early rabbinic midrash or interpretation, that the word le'olam, forever, does not really mean forever, but it means until the jubilee year. Now, clearly, the rabbis are doing this because they, or a tradition that they inherited, are trying to make these three legal collections into a single unified legal collection. And thus, they are engaging in what one scholar brilliantly calls creative philology. Being creative in terms of what words mean, they need not mean what they usually mean. Spinoza, or really post-Spinoza, people are saying, hold it. Words mean what they mean. The olam, everywhere else in the Bible, means forever, till eternity, in perpetuity. Therefore, they would say that there is a straightforward contradiction, not an apparent contradiction, between Exodus and Deuteronomy on, one, on the one hand and Leviticus on the other hand. And they will say the fact that this contradic contradiction exists reflects the fact that this must not be a single authored capital A book, but is a book which has many authors, lowercase a, and that is the beginning of the historical critical method. So what it comes down to then, is, as you look at these things uh, with historical criticism, um, you'll notice things about the text that earlier uh, religious believers had found other ways to deal with or other ways to reconcile. Spinoza comes on the scene and he offers something new. He offers the position that, hey, maybe this is just, we should look at this as a text like all other texts and, and read it that way, which kind of does away with, uh, you know, hundreds of years of, of how the Bible uh, was being read. So, so 
when you bring those academic tools to bear on the Bible, you're you're going to get criticism from multiple angles as a believer. Uh, from one angle, you're going to hear it from believers who say, oh, you know, Spinoza, clearly this man was an atheist. He's not, he's an unbeliever. We should, we should not give heed to these things. You, uh, if, but if you say, no, it's possible, it's possible to, to read it critically uh, and be faithful, then you'll hear from uh, critics who would say, hey, what, why are you still trying to believe in this stuff? You've seen all this evidence that the Bible's just created by people and, and, and that it's not what they thought it was. So you can kind of get criticism from both sides. Have you, have you felt like that? Uh, I, I certainly have. <laughs> and the criticism that you noted is really quite sharp because it's not that I'm going against hundreds of years of interpretation. I'm actually, if you look at Spinoza historically, I'm going, I'm going against over 1500 years of interpretation. And certainly uh, Spinoza, who was a pantheist, should is not usually upheld yeah. as a central Jewish figure. Usually would not put him, for example, in the same category as somebody like Maimonides, for example. So the question really becomes, when a person says that they are, they are a believer, what does that mean? And I guess to look at that in a little bit more detail, um, what does that mean that they believe in? So in my case, and I'm, I am really only speaking for myself, both in this interview and in the book, which is why I called the ch my chapter in the book my Bible, because I did not want to pretend that I am speaking for the entire Jewish community, which of course would be, in, would be impossible. Uh, my belief concerning the origin of the Bible, or more particularly, and this is the crucial issue within the Jewish community, the origin of the first five books of the, of the Bible, the Torah, because there really is a difference Jewishly between the origin of the Torah and the origin of all of the other books, because so much of Jewish law is connected to the Torah and is not connected to what is Jewishly the other parts parts of the canon, the prophets and the writing. And by the way, that's a big difference between Judaism versus Protestantism and Christianity. I really need to separate out the origins of the Torah from the origins of the rest of the Bible when I spoke in a way that my Protestant and Catholic colleague did not need to separate, to make that particular type of distinction. So I do not have the traditional rabbinic beliefs about the origin of the Torah. I do not believe that the Torah reflects what, what, what God dictated in some form to Moses on Mount Sinai. I do not believe that the standard rules for interpreting the Bible, which were developed or reflected in the rabbis, where various apparent contradictions are reconciled, are the main way in which I want to interpret the Bible. Yet nevertheless, I do believe that in some sense, the Torah does reflect my ancestors' encounter with the divine. And I do believe that it is a central book for me, even though I may be interpreting it in a way which is very different than the Jewish community interpreted it, let's say 700 years ago. And I do know that it is a central book for the Jewish community. So in that sense, I am a believer. Uh, I'll also say that the particular way in which I believe the Torah to be particularly important is one of just several ways in which people in the Jewish community who are whom I would call traditional Jews who are never the, who nevertheless accept a critical attitude uh, talk about the Bible about a year and a half ago I co-founded a website called 
thetorah.com. T H E T O R A H dot com, which deals with different ways that traditional Judaism reconciles, if you like that word, the belief that the Torah did not come into existence in the way that the rabbis said it did, but nevertheless uphold elements or most of or all of traditional Jewish belief. On that website, we outline nine different ways that modern Judaism has figured out of really keeping both sides of the equation. A belief that the Torah is a, the central text of Judaism and an interest in upholding traditional Jewish observance. Do you think a lot of contemporary Jews are interested in getting to the historical core of these things? Because biblical criticism sort of looks at, tries to situate the Bible in its original setting and understand it according to the original uh, people who compiled it and who used it, right? So are, are a lot of Jews interested in, in that? You're asking a great question. And you're asking a question that really gets to my life work. <laughs> uh, if I were to answer your question honestly, I think I would have to say no. In other words, the bottom line is I look around me and speak to Jewish people of varying backgrounds. Uh, their main interest, and this is something that really is very Jewish, is what does this text mean to me? Which is just the opposite of what a historian would do. Uh, I think that that is an important question, but I also think that the question of what did the Bible once mean, once people begin to think about that question, is a question that many people find incredibly engaging. So, and thus, following a really great scholar of religion, Christer Stendhal, who taught for many years at Harvard Divinity School, then he was Bishop of Stockholm, then for several years he was down the hall from me at Brandeis University. He has a very famous article on biblical theology in which he argues that what biblical theology is all about is the dialogue between what the Bible meant in the past in its original context, and what the Bible means now. So I'm, I'm persuaded by Stendhal. I think that that's what a very, one possibility for what a very mature religious perspective would look like. Now, of course, if you're going to have a dialogue between what the Bible meant and what the Bible means, then having a historical understanding of the Bible is crucial because that's the first half of this dialogue. Do you find it difficult to get to that point, though? Do you find people who say, well, no, this the way we believe it today is the way that they uh, understood it back then? I, of course, I confront that. But then I try to explain to people that the Bible, like any other text, had a historical context. And once you explain that to people and you make some of that past realia and history come alive, uh, then most people are willing to acknowledge, albeit often initially in a begrudging fashion, that the Bible did have an original context and it is helpful to understand it in that original context. And going back on something that I said before, uh, it can be incredibly helpful because most you know, people in the Jewish community no longer want there to be slavery. So, when right, they that's say, not a difficult one to. <laughs> yeah, that is not that is not a difficult one. There are more difficult ones which maybe we won't touch. Yes. But uh, but that one, when you suddenly place the Bible within its historical context, where that type of slavery was the norm of the ancient Near Eastern world, then suddenly the Bible does make more sense and actually becomes less problematic as an authoritative work. Hmm. So we, so much for people who kind of look at biblical criticism, believers who do. Let's talk for a second too about within the academy. So when you come into the academy, a lot of 
um, higher criticism, as it was originally referred to, had certain assumptions such as, you know, there there aren't miracles. So if if a text describes a miracle, that's something that didn't happen, or or at least something that we can't verify or justify. And these types of ideas, have you felt in your academic work that there has been resistance to a believer engaging in these texts and bringing belief along with you? Uh, have you felt like you've had to leave your belief at the door of the academy or that you've been able to bring that into your work? I think that there are certain aspects of my belief I probably do leave at the door of the classroom and that I should leave at the door of my classroom. Uh, on the other hand, I think that being an observant Jew and a believer in some sense is very, very helpful for me as a critical religious scholar and a critical scholar of the Hebrew Bible, because even the non-believer would have to admit that this is a religious text, however you might want to define the word religious. But in parts of my life, I understand this as a religious text as a deeply religious text. It informs my worldview. I understand how it informs the worldview of my ancestors. And I actually think that that helps understand, will help people understand what the text meant. I think that there are too many people who try to interpret the Bible who do not have any liter who do not have any theological or religious sensitivity. So I think having that sensitivity is crucial for understanding what the text is trying to say, how that text developed, how that text might have been used in its earliest community. But I do not want to be uh, I, I do not want to be very specific about enforcing or even stating my specific Jewish positions in class, because after all, I'm teaching at a secular liberal arts institution, and it is really not my place to do that. My place is to open up this text to as many people who want to read it as possible. That's Mark Brettler. He's joining us today from Massachusetts. We're talking about the book that he contributed to. It's called The Bible and the Believer, How to Read the Bible Critically and Religiously. Uh, let's zoom in a bit on some of the tools that, that um, biblical criticism uses to analyze texts and to kind of get at the historical context and origins. And so I'll throw out a few uh, terms here and have you just give brief descriptions so people can get a sense for the type of work that biblical uh, critics do. So um, – Let's say, so textual criticism, philology, and form criticism. Let's start with, uh, with those. Textual criticism, philology, and form criticism. Sure. Uh, textual criticism is an attempt to create, and here it will depend whom you ask, either the best or the most original form of a text that can be done. Text criticism as the... British text critic and poet Hausman noted, is somewhere between an art and a science. But you shouldn't throw it out because it has artistic uh, an artistic element to it. Text criticism has become especially important since the publication of the Dead Sea Scrolls, starting in 1947, where those scrolls show that the text, which was standardly accepted as the Hebrew Bible text, called the Masoretic text, had a very clear history. So let me just give you a single example. Mm -hmm. In Exodus chapter 1, it says that the number of descendants of Jacob who came down with him to the land of Egypt was 70. Shiv'im, 70. That the beginning of the book of Exodus is preserved in several Dead Sea Scroll fragments. Indeed, one of them does have Shiv'im 7D in it, but another has Chamesh Shiv'im, another has Shiv'im V'chamesh, each of which means 75. 
Hmm. which is actually a reading which is found in some manuscripts where the New Testament quotes Exodus chapter 1. So there it becomes clear through textual criticism that, number one, this text had not yet stabilized in, let's say, the early first century of the Common Era. And then the second thing that textual criticism will do is based on manuscript and conjecture will try to figure out what the best or the most original reading was. Okay. So the next thing you mentioned is philology. Mm -hmm. uh, philology has to do with the understanding of words using the best understanding of languages, language, and grammar that we have. So one very significant advantage that we have in the 21st century over anybody who lived more than two centuries ago is that we understand the language much better through the discipline of linguistics. But in addition to that, we have a large number of languages which are related to, or to use the fancier word, cognate to biblical Hebrew that were discovered over the last few centuries. So, for example, uh, starting in the 1800s, Akkadian, the language, the main Semitic language of ancient Mesopotamia, was deciphered. Uh, starting in the 1920s, Ugaritic, a Canaanite language from a site called Ugarit or Ras Shamra in Syria, those tablets were discovered and were deciphered. And as a result of that, uh, we often can understand specific Hebrew words or specific Hebrew grammatical forms much better than we would have earlier when we had Hebrew, which of course is what the, most of the Bible is written in, Aramaic, which is what a small section, a small part of the Bible, several chapters uh, were written in, and Arabic, which is a Semitic language related to Hebrew, but it's really sort of like a second cousin once removed. Mm -hmm. It is not all that close. So through these different languages, we're often able to understand different Hebrew words. We're, we're, I'm sorry. Uh, through the discovery of these languages, we're often able to understand particular Hebrew words differently than they might have been understood years ago. We might realize that there are homonyms in a, in a particular word and so forth. So that's philology. And so to sort of be like a thousand years from now, someone finds a text here say, uh, in, in English that says, I, I, I ate lunch, I had a quesadilla. And this person knowing nothing of you know Spanish or anything later discovers a Spanish text that's speaking about quesadillas. And they say, oh, there's some relation here between these languages are borrowing from each other. Is that kind of philology? Like they'll look at the exactly. – okay. yeah, that's, that's a big part of it. Okay. Yes. So, so form criticism is the next one. Form criticism, in part because its name is so opaque, is a little harder to explain. So I'm going to explain it via an analogy. When we read and interpret a particular document, we look at two things. We look at the, what the word means, and we look at the genre Mm -hmm. in which the particular words are printed. So the analogy is, uh, you know, I live not far from Boston. I will read or decode, say out loud, the same words from the first page of the Boston Globe and from the first page of the Sunday comic section in exactly <laughs> the same way. If it says T-H-E space P-R-E-S-I-D-E-N-T, I'm going to read those words, the president, whether it's on page one of the globe or let's imagine Doonesbury in the hmm. comics. But coming to Doonesbury, that's a different genre. And that's why form criticism is sometimes called a genre criticism. That's a different genre than the first page of the news. It is intending to use those same words to communicate something other than the literal truth. So what form criticism does, 
is it breaks it breaks up pieces of the Bible and gives them genre labels. So, for example, it might take a psalm and we'll say that some of these psalms are laments of the individual and some of there are some of them are hymns and that would help you understand them. And then the second thing that form criticism does is it then tries to get behind these genre labels. It asks the question, what social situation or what cultural situation? Often the German form, the German term, sitz im Leben, situation in life, is used in form criticism. So what sitz im Leben would have engendered this particular form. So to give you a very important example concerning this, the book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Torah, has almost exactly the same form as the treaties that the Assyrians of power in Mesopotamia had with their vassals, with their subject peoples. And then you suddenly realize, oh my gosh, Deuteronomy is a treaty, but instead of being a treaty between some great Assyrian king and some power who was subservient to the king, it is a treaty between God and Israel. And then you suddenly realize, for example, that when it says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, you have to love the Lord your God, it also said in the Assyrian treaties that you have to love your overlord. So love probably means the same thing in Deuteronomy 6 as it does in the Assyrian vassal treaties. And then you can go even one step further and you could ask yourself, huh, if Deuteronomy looks like an Assyrian vassal treaty, then it probably came into being when the Assyrians were the overlords or the suzerains of the Judeans, and that would have been in the 7th century. So it not only helps us understand the book of Deuteronomy, but it helps us understand the most likely time in which it was composed. And it's sort of like I, I recently read a book about the book of Job, and it's sort of a similar thing, right? Like the book of Job, if people open that book and read it without understanding the context, they might take it as just another biblical book um, telling a historical story. But but the way yeah. that Job's framed right, is sort of more like – a myth like that original readers would have known that as if if I open a book today and it says once upon a time there was a magical kingdom I know okay I'm reading a fairy tale right is in the book of Job is sort of similar that way right the book of Job is similar that way just hold on one second I need to get a book behind me which yeah sure really sure important points. so you were asking about the book of Job and the initial words of the book of Job in Hebrew are ish haya be'eretz utz iov shemo which if I translate them literally, would be, there was a man in the land of Uts, and Job was his name, which in a sense sounds incredibly historical. Right. But there are other hints in the book that it should not be read so historically. And indeed, there's a brilliant translation of the book of Job by a literary scholar and translator, Stephen Mitchell, which opens up with, once upon a time in the <laughs> land of Ooze, there was a man named Job. Now, I've often wondered about this translation as a person who teaches biblical Hebrew, because certainly if Mitchell had been in my biblical Hebrew class and he wrote this as a translation of Ishaya Be'eretz Utz Iov Shemo, I would have failed him <laughs> because as a translation, it should be, there was a man in the lands of Utz, Job was his name. But on the other hand, in terms of genre and what Mitchell talks about in various places, tone he gets it just right. So what form criticism does is it gives you a sense that when you're translating, don't only rely on terms of meaning on what each word means, but look at the form as a whole, try to understand the genre of 
the larger book or section as a whole, and then uh, then uh, translates in a way that is appropriate in terms of tone for that larger composition. So that's form criticism. Now, all right, so the next ones are source criticism, redaction criticism, and rhetorical criticism. Those are the next three. Source, redaction, and rhetorical. Source criticism is largely applied either to the Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, or the Hexateuch, the first six books of the Bible, namely the Torah plus Joshua. It refers to the idea that the Pentateuch or the Hexateuch as we now have it is comprised of several pre-existent written sources that have been edited, compiled, or redacted together to form the book which we now have. So what source criticism tries to do is to disentangle sections of the Bible and to recreate those earlier written sources which have been combined together to our current text. So that brings me right to the next term which you used, which is um, redactional criticism. Since the person who brought these earlier written texts together is often called the redactor, and indeed even abbreviated with the letter R, redaction or redactional criticism attempts at understanding what was the redactor trying to do when he brought these different documents together? What choices did he make? If you want to imagine an old image of a liter of a film editor, what was left on the floor? What little scraps were left? Uh, if you want to imagine an image of someone who's mixing different audio pieces, why were the audio pieces mixed together in this way rather than that way? So redactional criticism is just about always a second stage after source criticism and attempts to understand why the sources have been combined in the particular way in which they have. Uh, rhetorical criticism is something which is really very different. In fact, rhetorical criticism to some extent developed as a reaction against source criticism. Source criticism takes the text apart. What rhetorical criticism, which was a term that was widely used by a scholar named James Meilenberg, I think in the 60s, in the 1960s, and continues to be used, is not interested in the prehistory of the text, but is interested in the rhetoric of the text as it now stands. In other words, how does the text make its main points? Mm -hmm. Rhetorical criticism is often very closely related to literary study of the Hebrew Bible. What literary devices might be used that make the biblical text so effective? So that's rhetorical criticism. And that kind of helps you get it like if you can see uh, what the – compilers were doing with the text, you can kind of get at the type of ideas they were trying to communicate or what was important to them at that time. And is that sort of so rhetorical criticism? Yeah, then, yeah, yeah, exactly. So with redaction criticism, if you can, with some confidence, create the pre-existing documents that were redacted together, one of the things that you see is that the redactor often, in putting the material together one way rather than another, highlighted one text, one, or one source rather than another. So that might give us a sense of which source the redactor thought was more important. Or you might say that one text is preserved relatively whole, while another text has many pieces missing for it, missing from it, excuse me. So that will also give you a sense of what the redactor found more important, because that's the stuff the text that he felt comfortable editing more heavily, he probably thought was a less important text. 
the criticism that's raised at this point then is we look at these different methods and some would say, okay, so you're trying to reconstruct this original text or you're trying to understand these in these different ways. It sounds like sort of trying to unscramble the omelet. That's the phrase that I've heard people use, right? It's like, oh, well, you've got the omelet. Now you're trying to put it back in the egg. It's just not going to work. What, what, what's the response to that? So the phrase you used to unscramble the omelet was used by the British structuralist anthropologist, Sir Edmund Leach, and is one of my favorite phrases, and it's simply wrong. Because <laughs> to me, the Bible does not look like an omelet. Again, I don't know what these different types of eggs are called in your part of the woods, but you know, uh, I imagine the Bible is more like what we'd call here eggs over easy. <laughs> in other words, we, the um, it, it doesn't look scrambled to me. I still see a yolk there, oh. and I still see a white there, and I really see them as different entities. So I agree that it's quite difficult to unscramble an omelet, though I'm sure science has figured out some way of doing it. But the basic metaphor of the Bible is an omelet or the Torah is an omelet, I think is a mistaken one. One of the points that I thought was interesting, um, this is kind of changing up gears, but in your discussion about the historicity of the Hebrew Bible, uh, you mentioned that, that Darwin and and evolution have been overall sort of less threatening in Judaism, and that that has in part has something to do with how uh, how Jews often read Genesis. H how do you account for that? That is, as Darwin came out with this theory, it didn't cause the same sort of shock waves for Jews that it did for many Christians who read Genesis differently. Much of Jewish reading of the Bible, and especially Jewish medieval reading of the Bible, takes the Bible non-literally. And in fact, thinks that if you read the Bible as only, maybe that word should be in quotation marks, as only history or only science, you're really reducing the sanctity of the Bible by seeing it as an only sort of text. So within Judaism, there have traditionally been many ways of interpreting the Bible. And the what I guess I'll call the literal, which could include the scientific and historical, has been one of these many ways, but has never been the only way in which the text should be read. So for that reason, you know, certainly there were some shockwaves, but if you compare the reception of Darwin in Judaism, even in very traditional Judaism, to its reception in some branches, especially of the Protestant church, uh, there were never as great shockwaves. There always was an ability to say, well, the Bible is talking about a different sort of truth than historical truth or scientific truth. Speaking of these different ways to kind of understand uh, the Bible according to Jews, some believing scholars have suggested that that Torah is something beyond the text, that it's not necessarily limited to the written words on the page, but rather that the, the words on the page are trying to capture that that more transcendental Torah in this imperfect human language. What, what do you think about about that view? For me as a practicing Jew, that's fundam of fundamental importance. For me as a biblical scholar, that is not a view that I subscribe to. So it really depends which Mark Brettler. So how do you separate? Is it just the context that you're speaking in? Like, how do you separate between how you would answer that question? Uh, or how do you do That's a weird way to put it. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. You know, it does depend on the context to which I'm speaking and thinking. But again, just to remind you something that I said before about Christer Stendhal, even when I'm speaking as a contemporary Jewish believer, I still, in which case, the words on the page are never sufficient. The words are super infused with meaning, as they are according to Jewish tradition. I still like seeing the way in which this text 
reinterpreted is in dialogue with what the text originally meant. Uh, toward the end of your chapter, you talk about three particular beliefs, two or points, uh, t- three points. The first two are scholarly beliefs, and the third one is a personal religious belief. And, and this is how you, you know, you bring these things together. So, can you talk about those three points there, the scholarly and the personal religious ones that you bring together in your approach to the Bible? Sure. The first two, which are scholarly approaches are really connected. Although the first, given your earlier questions, has more to do with source criticism. The second has more to do with text criticism and to some extent redactional criticism. The first is that the Torah is a composite text that came into being over time. And the second is that the text of the Torah was flexible, even after it came into being as a whole, flexible for a certain period of time until it ultimately became fixed. So the implication of that, of those two conclusions, is that the Torah is I and the entire Jewish community have it. Because the one thing that the entire Jewish community does agree on is what the text of the Torah, indeed the whole Hebrew Bible, is. It means that the text that we now have is not the same as, quote, the original text or earlier texts or more original texts. Now, that would make many people think, if we don't have the original text, or if you believe that historically the text has come into being over time, then why do you treat it in any special way? My third point is, I was born Jewish and feel a deep devotion and commitment to Jewish tradition and practice. So what the rest of that chapter does and what I do, which reflects what I do as an individual, is how do I bring together my feeling of being deeply Jewish and deeply devoted and committed to Jewish tradition and practice, while I know that the book to which this practice and to which these beliefs are often connected is a book which was not received from Moses on Mount Sinai, but was a book that came together over a long period of time. And I do that in my way in that chapter. Other people have found other ways of doing it, but I certainly believe, and that's why I have a whole chapter, rather than one or two words which would say, no, you can't be a biblical, historical, critical scholar and a believer. That's not my position. So the rest of the chapter explains in how I personally am able to bring these different sets of beliefs together. One of them, a religious belief about the centrality of Judaism to my life, and the other, a scholarly belief about how the Torah came together within history. So how do you do it then? What's the what's the secret sauce for you in terms of making these two worlds come together? Yeah, I, I don't want to claim that it's a secret source because it's there in the chapter, nor do I want to claim that it is the only secret source because indeed, as I said, the Torah.com shows nine ways that people bring these two different spheres together. But my way is that the Torah as we now have it is central because the Torah as we now have it is the Torah that the Jewish community brought together and helped to create as the Torah. So usually when people think about Torah or Holy Scriptures and sanctity, people think that the scriptures become whole, that the scriptures are holy scriptures because they are sanctified. The sanctification and holiness comes before or is prior to their scriptural status. I believe exactly the opposite. 
In other words, I believe that my community has created this set of works now called the Torah as scripture. And it's as a result of the creation of the Torah by my community that it becomes holy. In other words, the holiness or sacredness derives from what my community has done rather from anything which relates directly to revelation. So the cha- so what's interesting is um, in this book you have responses from the two other scholars that sort of add a little – a response to each individual chapter. And Peter Enns, who is the Protestant evangelical scholar, addresses this issue because it sort of unsettles him. This, uh, I think that as an evangelical scholar, he, he says that you kind of depict the Bible more as a point of departure re- for reflection and, and devotion and, and worship rather than a settled on rule book that just sets it all out there uh, for all time. So he's sort of unsettled by the possibility that a community could hypothetically disregard anything in that text or even choose a whole other text when a community could gather around uh, seven habits of highly effective people or something and, and sort of make that their holy book. So his concern is about who's master and, and where is God in the process. How do you respond to that particular concern? Yeah. So let me separate out some of the things that you've said. I don't think that you can be Jewish and have as your Bible the seven habits of effective <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think what really makes you Jewish is that you have as your central text the Bible. I think one fundamental difference between the way in which Protestants look at the Bible, traditional Protestants look at the Bible, and the way in which traditional Jews look at the Bible is that traditional Protestants are really most interested in the one thing that the text means. If you're a traditional Jew, you are aware that the Bible has always been interpreted in different ways at any point in Jewish history by different people in the community. In fact, there's a rabbinic statement, which is very, very core to Judaism, which says, Shiv'im panim la Torah. There are 70 faces or facets to the Torah, which means that any single verse or phrase or word in the Torah can be interpreted in 70 different ways. Now, for some, that's unsettling. For me, that I don't know if you could say settling, but for me, <laughs> that is a very, very settling notion. And I think that as a historian, I can certainly see how Jewish interpretation of the Bible has changed over time. Some t- in different periods and places, certain types of interpretation were the ones that were more predominantly practiced rather than others. And I see myself as an interp- as a Jewish interpreter of the Bible as being a continuation of this Jewish tradition. So, you know, I, I am sorry if uh, my dear colleague and friend Pete Enns feels unsettled by this. But for me, I think that the strength of the Bible is the way in which it is able to accommodate ever different interpretations over time. So maybe what Peter Enns sees as an unsettling weakness, I see as a strength, because I believe that if the Bible were only interpreted as one way over history, and let's say it would be the interpretation, I'll just pick a year, from the year 167 of the common era, <laughs> then we would have lots of interp- lots of problems as Jews with that interpretation because we're almost two millennia later. It's the ability of the Bible to accommodate all these different interpretations. And it's the ability of some texts which were once important to become less important and texts which were less important to become more important that indeed has made the Bible stand the test of time. And to give just a very simple Jewish example, post-Holocaust, the book of Job suddenly became much more important within the Jewish community. So I think it's a strength that it was there as if it was waiting to 
be in dialogue with perhaps the greatest theological problem of the 20th century. Well, I'll, I'm, I'll be talking with Peter in a couple in an upcoming episode, so I'll, I'll run. I'm going to run the same sort of question by him, and and and, and I'll let you know I'll, uh, how how he responds to that. So, um, two more questions. Uh, first, want to say you know, thanks a lot for for taking the time to do this. This has been great. Um, the first question that I have before we wrap things up is whether you have, if you have any examples of how your scholarship has impacted your devotional life, are there things that your academic work has done that have been fulfilling for you, uh, in a religious sense? I could probably give you many examples, but let me give you just a single example from something that I'm now working on. Uh, As an observant Jew, I pray daily. And something that over the last few years I've discovered has been disturbing me about prayer is when most of us think about prayer, it's prayer to God. Many Jewish prayers are actually about God rather than to God. Talking about God's qualities, for example. And over the last few years, in my personal Jewish observant life, I've really been wondering, like, why can't I use this opportunity to, in some sense, talk to God, with God in the second person? And why am I spending all this time talking about God? From my recent study of the book of Psalms, I'm now writing part of a commentary on Psalms, I realized that Psalms does this very often. I've begun to explore the reasons why this happens in Psalms. The reason stated very broadly is when you talk about God, you are then forming a community of like-minded people who have the same things to say about God. And that's an amazingly important social function. And as a result of that, when I pray and I talk about God in the third person in some of the Jewish prayers, those prayers are now much more meaningful for me. Mm. So that's one example of how my scholarly life can have an impact on my personal Jewish life. Have you? Has there been any way in which it's been harmful or, or which it's made it more of a struggle to be religious? Certainly not harmful. Struggle is a useful word. I think struggle in religion is a good thing. I don't believe in simple religion. I believe in changing over time. So certainly my beliefs as a biblical scholar have changed over time, particular beliefs that I have as a Jew. But I think that that's something very constructive for me. And quite honestly, I believe very broadly that there's something very, very constructive for anyone who is a religious believer, that these beliefs mature and stew and change over time as we grow older and we confront different texts and different ideas. So you haven't felt, I mean, so there is a risk. I mean, there's a risk that you could lose something cherished there though too, right? I mean, it's possible. It is always possible. I don't think it's going to happen with me. When I teach this material, I try to teach it in a way which I believe makes it safe so that I, I do not teach ever with the hope that I am going to change someone's cherished religious beliefs and make them less religious or non-religious. But I think the advantage is that you gain, from my perspective, a much deeper and more mature understanding of your religious tradition. So the last question kind of actually launches directly off of that, and that's that in your particular interaction in this book where you worked with a Catholic and a Protestant scholar uh, and and how they read the Bible as compared to your own tradition, did did you learn anything surprising in that engagement that you hadn't uh, considered before or that has changed your view about any particular part of what it means to read the Bible as a believer? Uh, I don't think any of my beliefs were changed, but what I really did realize and this in some ways comes back to something you asked about the first, in your very first question, is that we are not really reading the same Bible. Mm. 
And mm. by which I mean not only what I answered then, that the Jewish Hebrew Bible is different in order than the Christian Bible, or that there may be different books or chapters in the Catholic Old Testament. But at least in two ways, the Jewish Bible is different. The first one is totally obvious, but was not really as obvious to me until I was in dialogue with my two colleagues, namely just how different it is to read the Old Testament as part of a larger Bible, which contains right. the New Testament. And uh, a book which I edited uh, 10 years ago, co-edited, excuse me, was the Jewish Study Bible. And it's, it's a biblical interpretation by Jews that deals with some Jewish perspectives. And the experience of writing this book was like my favorite letter after I wrote that after I co-edited that particular book, where somebody wrote to me and said that before reading the interpretation in the Jewish study Bible on the suffering servant passages in Isaiah, she had never realized that it is possible to read these passages without reference to Jesus. Right. Now, I'm very happy that the annotations in that Bible helped her realize this. But the, the Hebrew Bible versus the Old Testament just means such different things on whether or not you have Jesus anywhere in your mind right. as you're reading this book. The second thing that occurred to me is really a very, is a major difference, is within Jewish tradition, even though there are three parts of the canon, Torah, prophets, and writings, the Torah is really the first among equals. It is more, to use a word that makes me a little nervous because I'm never sure what it means, it is more authoritative, it is more important, it is read much more often liturgically, it is studied much more often Jewishly. Uh, the Christian tradition has a very, very different emphasis on what the most important book or books of the Bible yeah, are. Yeah, I think they call that like the canon within the canon, right? They call it the canon, exactly. As I like to think of it, it's as if in each religious tradition, if you could take the hundred verses that you think are most important and you bolded them, I think something that would be quite significant, this would be a great project for someone to yeah. do, is to see if there's any overlap between the Jewish best 100 versus the Catholic and Protestant most important 100 verses. Yeah. So that really shows you how even if you all have, even if each community, each religious community says the Bible is central, what they make out of the Bible which texts they claim are the most central, the ones they read, the ones they study, are different for each of the communities, and that makes a huge difference. I like that. And that's another benefit of, of sort of interreligious dialogue when you can learn more about the canon within the canon that other, that other people uh, pay attention to, Jewish, Catholic, Protestant, or, or whatever else. Um, so you mentioned – now. Uh, just to close up, we're, we talked today with uh, Dr. Mark Brettler. He contributed to the book The Bible and the Believer, How to Read the Bible Critically and Religiously. And he also mentioned during the interview that he has a website, uh, thetorah.com, where you can learn more about different ways to choose read the Bible. Do you have any other projects that, uh, that you'd like to promote before we close? Uh, nothing to promote, but I'll just say that one of the wonderful outcomes of working on the Bible and the Believer is that I've also worked together with Amy Jill Levine, who is a professor of New Testament at Vanderbilt University, where we put together a book called The Jewish Annotated New Testament. Okay, which, yes. Which really shows you that you do not have to be of a particular religious tradition in order to interpret books which have become central to that religious tradition. 
So I'm a great believer in the importance of both the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament to the broader American community. And I hope that more people may, as a result of this interview, pick up the Bible, read it, understand it, and engage with it in one form or another. Thank you, Dr. Brettler. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, and your questions have really been wonderful. Thank you. That was part one of our two-part series on the Bible and the believer, how to read the Bible critically and religiously. In part two, we'll speak with Peter Enns. He's the Protestant representative and biblical scholar in this book. He teaches biblical studies at Eastern University. That's up ahead on the Maxwell Institute podcast. 